Go ahead. This is Tony D. Hey. All right. Hi, this is Tony Dottino. I am Tony Dottino and the founder of the USA Memory Championship. I'm in the different spirits tonight. Uh, I just want to let my Live with Tony audience know that uh, coming this Saturday, uh, after nine months of quarantining and staying close to home, uh, we have found a uh, isolated resort in Florida and we're going to go take off on Saturday for a week and uh, just go kind of hang out uh, at a resort and see what the world looks like and watch boats and yachts swim up and down the, uh, the Gulf of uh, Tech, uh, Mexico and uh, we'll take some walks on the beach. So I'm looking forward to that. actually started doing some packing for that. So uh, after, fr uh, I'll do one on Friday since I'm not going to be doing this Saturday. And then uh, it's a week off. So uh, glad to be here tonight and I want to get right to it. <clears throat> the Science of Learning, a special issue of Time Magazine. And what I was talking about is what, what begins to shape our learning. And it got me as I was reading it, I'll share a couple of the things that were in here and the benefits of early learning and what parents can do. It had me thinking about uh, the, 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 the love and the care and the nurturing we did with my own children. And then the lessons I learned that I actually had uh, my kids and, uh, and worked on with my grandkids. And what a difference it's made. I've got three amazing grandchildren that are just uh, totally brilliant in what they do. Uh, they really have got what it takes up in here to make a big difference in their lives. So let's, uh, let's go through that. With my kids, at an early age, we did, we used to read to them storybooks. Now, you know, like all these storybooks for kids, you know, Dr. Zeus books and things of that sort, we had a whole lot of different storybooks that we would read to them every night. So every night before bed, and maybe from about two years old on, we'd sit there and read a storybook, and they'd sit there, and they were so attentive, and we'd point to pictures and different animals and then different letters, and so... Uh, my, my wife and I would just uh, spend every night reading to the kids. And when we had our second child, we'd sit there with them together and they'd both look at it and they were both very attentive. And they would just sit there and just sponges. They would just love what we were, were reading to them. We'd, we'd take turns. So I'd take one night and she'd take another. And the kids would just look forward to that. And then we'd put them to bed. And we did that and had stacks of books and stacks of books. As they got a little bit older, and uh, this was really big with my, my grandkids, because we the same principle, we saved books. My kids took their books off the, with their kids, and we still probably have a lot of their books. One of my favorites, The Little Engine That Could. The Little Engine That Could. Certainly Dr. Seuss books. Lots of different funds with, with Dr. Seuss books. But then the next thing we did, uh, because we were a family, a game pay playing family, playing different games, be it Monopoly or Clue or uh, what's that, uh, Candyland. I mean, there was just a series of games that uh, we would play. And the kids learned, obviously, to count the numbers on our own dice, and they'd learn different strategies in terms of, of properties. And my grandkids were, were pretty quick, uh, probably six or seven years old, could grab the concepts of what were in the games and how to go about winning and beating grandpa and grandma and mom and dad. And so we were a big game plan family that really made a, a big difference in terms of, of uh, the enjoyment, the fun, uh, the camaraderie, the spirit. Sometimes we played in the teams, mom and dad versus the kids, and mom and son with mom and daughter. I mean, we had all these different variations. And then as uh, my kids adapted those behaviors, they carried those with their grandkids because obviously to them, it seemed to have made a difference. And what better way than in our current environment that we have to be able to take time with kids and be with family at, after dinner? And we, this would be a, a requirement. We'd have dinner and, boy, I'm working my tail off. and and doing what I had to do, but boy, it was it was something we enjoyed doing, sitting around, not watching nearly as much television as, as I think kids do today, or, or what uh, I certainly do today. Uh, 
that was rare, I mean, in terms of just maybe a few shows that were our favorites. So here comes this Time Magazine article, and uh, it comes and it says, others agree with the traditional schools engage your minds are not ideal. Much of the work is focused on the learned methods and teaching, but what we really are learning to do is that kids in their early years, and they're talking up to three to five years old, develop learning habits based on what? What I just told you, their parents and their environment that they have and the nurturing that they're given. And so we're learning how to use numbers and learning to see and recognize letters, and recognizing numbers and how they apply to different things uh, at an early age before they're even uh, teenagers has a huge difference in the, the, the sponge of the brain and what it's learning. And what we know in their early you know, two to 10 years old, there's lots of dendritic spines that are being developed and lots of branches of their brain that are being created. And one of the things that I did with my grandkids at an early age, and two of the three really took to this, so I'll go to the two of the three, was we taught them how to mind map their lessons in their reading. And I taught them how to do that with the help of my daughter-in-law, who was a school teacher, and she still is, but she just loved the mind mapping, and she found that from about five to eight years old, she would teach this to the kids in her one of her classes, but also to my grandson. And I always remember at one of our USA Memory Championships that we did at Con Edison in New York City, one of the uh, things I had, my, I had a seven-year-old grandson get up and he had a mind map that he had done of one of the Harry Potter books. And he got that, I held that mind map to the side and he talked about this book as one of our keynote speakers at seven years old in one of our memory championships. And it just blew everybody away. So something he's developed at, at a very early age with help from his mom and the imageries and, and, and him, having him talk through his thinking, so how we developed his thinking skills and his creativity was how to mind map reading that he did. And he used that throughout his school days, be it middle school, high school, college. And to this day, he goes off into his own world and he mind maps out things that he's trying to absorb and learn. And he tells me he's one of the, I don't know what the game is, but he's one of the top 12 out of uh, 10,000 people in some of these, one of these games that he tends to play. And I'm not a gamer, so I don't know which one it is, but he tells me he's in the, the top 12 of 10,000 people. And how do he plays these games and moves things around? He actually coaches people in doing that. So uh, mind mapping at an early age. So what does this have to do with, with our memories today? Well, our life experiencing and the nurturing we do and the, how we bring that nurturing to bear is significant at any age. And sometimes we discount, you know, kids at a three and four and five, but if you stop and study just what a three and a four and a five-year-old is doing, they're like sponges, and they're absorbing as much of their environment and as much of their world as they possibly can. And it's at a time where there's enormous brain development that's taking place. And so here in this uh, article, it was talking about all of the time and money that we spend, especially through uh, middle school and high school, and the billions of dollars we put into different educational institutions. And the question always comes back to, and what are we doing with the kids as it relates to their early nurturing of their parents? And if there's one thing I feel saddest about today is seeing kids being raised with single parents and with the parent is just working and working and working to develop and have money to pay bills and provide food and sometimes to buy stuff, which I've learned with my own kids, they'd rather have my time than my stuff. So buying things for them is not their priority and it certainly wasn't the priority of buying my grandkids things. It was life experience and spending time with them, so taking a vacation with them 
and then not aware. It was more a matter of playing, taking a vacation at a campground and playing games. And they loved that as much as anything. And uh, doing uh, hikes and trails. They loved to go hike up mountainsides and wood trails and listen to birds and sounds of nature. And the blessing I have is these were things that we did for our vacations that didn't cost lots of money, but brought life skills to them that has clearly made a world of difference in their academic abilities. And we can do all of these. There's plenty of hiking trails and plenty of national parks and plenty of state parks that anybody can take their families to. And even with distancing and even putting a mask on and finding a trail that you can take your family on or the kids or grandkids on uh, is just fabulous. And we don't have to be climbing up mountains all the time. We can be going on flat ground. Here we are in Florida. We have lots of flat trails that go over even the boardwalks that they make so you're not over the swampy waters and taking kids along with those. It's amazing what all of my grandkids have found in terms of taking walks through nature. They just love it. And these were things that were developed when they were in their early years of living. So those are my tips for today. And uh, again, I'm, I'm turning away here at the Science of Learning from the special issue of Time Magazine. Let me just see. It's a special edition. There really is not a date on this. It's all about getting the most of how you learn and develop uh, as you get older. So again, reminder, I'll be on, uh, today is Wednesday, I'll be back on tomorrow afternoon. I will we'll do a Friday since uh, Saturday, it's off for a week's vacation. So hope all is well and keep those emails coming to A-D-O-T-T-I-N-O and at AOL. And uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow afternoon. Have a good evening.